Hello, uh, my name is Yuna Park and I'll be presenting on the brief history of emojis. So let me share my screen really quickly. So I'll be talking about emojis and how they came to be. Um, some questions I wanna cover during this time is what is an emoji? Where did it come from? How does it work? And why should we even care? So an emoji, if we break down the word in Japanese, E stands for picture, Mo stands for writing, and G stands for character. Basically, they're an encoded pictorial uh, symbol that can be used in line with text just like this. And they're not the same as emoticons or cowmoji. So an emo emoticon is like the sideway smiley, which was actually found or popularized by a professor at Carnegie Mellon back in 1982. And the emoji is the shruggy, the beloved shruggy. Um, and both of these are different than the emoji because emoji is supposed to be a single character, whereas these consist of multiple characters to create one expression. So the origins. Um, you guys have probably guessed by now, it's emojis come from Canada. Just kidding. Um, it was founded in the late 1990s in Japan um, when the mobile phone industry was booming. Um, and there was one uh, mobile company called Entity Docomo that was starting to notice some issues. With more people using their network, their bandwidth was becoming more and more limited and they couldn't process all of this data. So an engineer named Shigataka Kurita, the father of emojis, um, came up with an interesting idea. Here he is right now on the, on the side. Um, he noticed that teenagers were really drawn to this one pager called the pocket bell that had this pixelated heart emoji. And it was so popular that when Docomo came out with uh, business pagers and got rid of the pixelated heart, their, their sales dropped. So, um, and so he created the first 176 12 by 12 pixel, pixel uh, emojis. And um, they consisted everything from facial expressions to the weather or horoscopes. And they of course included the heart, which is his favorite. And then along came Apple. So in 2008, Apple was looking to break into the Japanese market with their iPhones. And they noticed that these picture stuff was really popular with the Japanese. So they decided to include it in their iPhone, in the iPhones only sold in Japan. So the rest of the world was deprived of these beautiful emojis until 2011 when iPhone decided to uh, make it global or Apple decided to make it global for all of their iPhones. And I just wanna take this moment to appreciate the first 176 emojis. I think they are really a work of art. So uh, kind of going into deeper of how this all works, um, there's this thing called the Unicode Consortium. So if you really think about it, we have all these devices that are using all of these different encodings for text, but when they are all um, created by different individual companies, they don't necessarily translate well into different, into different um, products, uh, across different products. So the Unicode Consortium came up with this idea of um, of standardizing all the encodings for characters that we see um, on our devices. And the most popular encoding is the UTF-8, uh, which is really great um, because it, it, uh, it um, is a working off of ASCII, which we've all, all probably heard about. Um, and ASCII is uh, the encoding that we use for the, for the Latin, uh, for languages based on the Latin alphabet. Um, so the way that UTF-8 works is they uh, encode each character in one to four bytes of code. Each byte consists of eight bits. Um, and so Unicode's goal is to encode all characters of every language so that you can read it on all computers or, de or devices or on your phone. And they do this by creating one unique code point for each character. And so by 2007, Unicode was like, 
maybe we should start looking at emojis and kind of trying to figure out how to standardize them carefully. Um, they were included since 1995, but they weren't really considered their own separate thing. So I'm going to take an example with the coffee emoji. Uh, so what you see on your phone usually is just this emoji presentation, which um, is kind of like a font for, for text. Um, these renderings, these designs are determined by individual companies. So that's why you'll see different pictures for Android versus iPhone. And then once you strip them of the design, it comes down to this black and white image, which is the text presentation. And this is the basic formatted image that Unicode um, is, is in charge of. And then this image right here, this black and white image is associated with a code point which right here is U plus 2615. And this gets translated down into UTF-8 into binary code, which is right here. Um, I'm not gonna try to read that out loud. Um, and it's made up of three bytes, as you can see, and each byte is separated by, um, by colon. And, and they're each made up of eight bits, which the computer can then use to um, render the correct uh, character. So, why should we even care about all of this? Um, well, first thing is, these folks seem to care pretty, pretty, pretty hard for these things because um, they pay $18,000 a year to be a full member of the Unicode Consortium. And basically, by being a full member, you have um, the majority voting rights to determine what, can be, what should be standardized. Um, so you can see all these big companies like Google, Facebook, Book, Apple. And I guess $18,000 is not that much money to them, but it definitely is a high barrier for smaller companies and for people like us. Um, and so this brings, you know, a lot of questions into mind. Like if, if, um, if you have the power to decide which characters can be rendered on the screen, and especially today when we all pretty much communicate through through computers um, constantly, perhaps even more than more than face to face, um, it puts it puts a lot of power into these members because they're kind of like the gatekeepers for what can or can't be communicated. Um, and it, with emojis growing so so popular um, across the world, some may even argue that it's a language in and of itself. Um, so that, I mean, that could be argued, but I, I can definitely see um, the arguments for it. So um, anyway, so remember how I said that the original emojis were a work of art? Well, I wasn't being ironic. They actually are. Um, they were acquired by the MoMA uh, back in, I believe, October 2016, just a few months ago. Um, so they're being displayed right now and are part of the permanent collection of MoMA. And when I found out about this, I had to go and take a photo check. So that's me at the MoMA. Um, and here's some really interesting resources that I encourage all of you to uh, look into. Uh, the Unicode's documentation on emojis is actually very well written. It's super readable. Um, and then there's a thing called Emojipedia. Yes, it does exist. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful collection of all of the emojis um, and a detailed, uh, detailed um, documentation of their code points and, and, and things like that. And then there's um, this really interesting video called Emoji and the Levitating Businessman. Um, it's, uh, it's by a man called, uh, named uh, Tom Scott, who's kind of like the unofficial, unofficial expert on emojis. And he definitely goes much more um, into depth about, about the, the earlier history of emojis. And then there is this thing called Emoji Tracker um, on, or, or yeah, Emoji Tracker, which basically tracks all the emojis that are being uh, used on Twitter in real time. And that is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you for listening.